Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon. What I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes is really to share with you in terms of how we use pervasive sensing for training, and more importantly, that, uh, how we can translate the technology for healthcare and well-being. So you've all enjoyed the uh, Olympic Games as well as the Paralympic Games, and you will see you know, the British athletes, how they're performing. Now they are on the second that the four, in terms of medal table, 17 gold, which is a really remarkable success. And for all these athletes, during their training and also during their performance, that for sports scientists and also for basic scientists like us, is really all about measure, model, and manipulate. But traditionally, all these processes are being done in the laboratory settings. And you can see that for elite athletes, this is really not practical. So this is really where sensing comes in. And with the support of EPSRC and also UK Sport, that we have put together a consortium called Esprit. It's really to look at how do we develop miniaturized sensors? How do we make the sensors even smaller? How do we embody them so that it's not impeding the performance? and how do we learn, and how do we model the data, and finally, how do we turn that into devices that can be used for training. So let me just share with you some of the examples of the uh, you know, sensors we are developing. You won't be able to see the small prints in this slide, but to just really uh, you know, anchor uh, some discussion points here that the sensors that can take the normal forms used off the shelf chips, as well as uh, specialized uh, you know, uh, uh, ASICs that for the sensor design, and not only looking at the biomechanical information, but also we look at the biochemical. And we have spent a lot of time integrating the sensors for different sports modalities, for instance, that uh, for wheelchair, for swimming, and also that uh, bob skeleton for some of the winter sports as well. So the key information we try to get here is that to move away from the traditional observation, experience, and also subjective measure into something that is objective, and also capture this subtle information that can really maximize the margin. Because in nowadays, the difference between a medalist and a finisher, that the margin between them is really small. So how do we maximize this margin and make use of detailed biomechanical information, biophysical information to help with the training? And this is really something we set out to do. So in terms of sensors, how small can we make it to be? I think for sports, the most important thing, as I mentioned earlier, is the sensor itself should not alter the equipment, alter the performance, nor impede the athlete performance itself. For instance, let me take one example, one of the devices that we've developed for wheelchair tracking. And historically, you have to you know, have a dedicated wheelchair and instrument with all the sensors. But now we can use one of those very small sensors. You clip it on 30 seconds, and you are in business. Well, what kind of accuracy, can you, accuracy you can achieve? So here is one example, although it's in the laboratory setting, as you can see here, that you will be able to track detailed information, not only the power output, but also in terms of localization, location information. So for team sports, such as wheelchair basketball, then you can, from those information, you can start to see team tactics, refine the performance, and also really start to turn. This is something traditionally by using uh, train, uh, trainer's experience into something that is objective. But we need to go far beyond that. And having those sensors for sports, for athletes, is one thing. But the whole purpose about this game is really to look at the legacy. How we can actually inspire the generation as a whole, youngsters that are engaging in physical activity rather than playing computer games that are only exercising their fingers. So with this, that we have set out to do is really how do we push this further? Push this further so that we can use the same sensing technology can benefit people like us and also people with unfortunate association with chronic diseases. So body sensor network is one concept that uh, from Imperial College and also with our partners that we try to push forward. Here is really to forego the use of those sensors that you see as a devices, but really want to push this used body as the media. You use the body to transmit signal. You use body as the source of energy so that you don't need to use batteries, and also use the body as a source of inspiration. 
so that you can have buy inspired design rather than that uh, more you know, uh, traditional engineering approaches. So what are the things that we need to address? This really opens up a lot of new opportunities. If you want to sense long term, then you need to address materials in terms of buy compatibility. You need to address wireless communication to make sure you use little or no you know, minimum energy. And you need to harvest energy from the environment rather than use batteries. And how do you make sure those sensors can organize themselves? Because if you have everybody has got sensors somehow positioned, and you certainly don't want to, you know, like your phone, and you have to, you know, configure and also change the settings and so on. So these are some of the things that we do. But you, in terms of healthcare, there's really a whole range of new sensors currently being developed and also being used. Here are some examples. You can look at the uh, you know, uh, ECG SpO2. These are all pervasive. And the glucose uh, sensing, blood pressure, you can also measure pH. And also, in, nowadays, you can even turn the traditional endoscopy into a pill that go inside the body and wirelessly transmit the data outside. So these are some of the examples, but you can certainly you know, make use of some of the latest development in terms of MEMS technology and also materials. So more in terms into the healthcare, what we are really looking at is how do we embody those sensors into instruments and into stents and also integrated with tissue engineering that you can combine sensing and also that uh, you know, material constructs in the same time. And this can also be linked with you know, uh, drug delivery system that to linking sensing and also closed loop drug delivery in the same time. So I talked about the importance of powering the device. And perhaps that you know, everybody here, in fact, got the same experience, that uh, what is the most troublesome thing for you to use your mobile phone is the daily charging. And for those sensors that if you want to make it to be able to work in the background pervasively, you certainly don't want to charge those devices. And here, there are a number of different ways of powering the device. And here I list some examples that are using solar cells, using temperature gradients, using human motion, and also vibration. And here, in the research community, we are really looking to different means of power scavenging or harvesting to power the devices. So I think in five years' time, that you will be able to see devices actually which will be what we call the zero power devices. Zero power with quotes that uh, you know, they do need energy, but the energy source is will no longer from the traditional battery sources. And also I talk about miniaturization and also uh, by inspired design. And here is one example that uh, in fact, the devices that can be made nowadays can be very small. Here is one example that uh, the picture, in fact, this is the real device. And on it, we have the two megabit per second wireless transmission integrated with three axis accelerometers and also temperature sensor and also with onboard microprocessor. So the sensor technology and also in terms of chip design certainly is making headways in terms of practicality in, in terms of size utilization. But there's also, there is the need to have what we call the on-node intelligence. Now, let me ask you one question here. One question is that, let me just say, you know, down this, uh, 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 this slide for one moment. We know that the importance of sensing gait, bar motion, the way how you walk, and so on. Now, if I ask you the question, if I only give you one sensor to put on your body, and I want to know if there is a problem with your ankle or with your knee, where would you position this sensor? The way how you walk. So if you have a problem with your joint, and where would you position the sensor to sense this continuously? Yeah? You put it on the shoe, in the shoes? OK, center of gravity. And maybe on the waist. And there are different ways of putting it. And if you are a Nike, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a person that you probably want to put in the shoe, and if you are a polar person, you probably put it on the belt, and you may want to put it on the waist in different places. But in fact, that uh, the best place for sensing how you walk and also the problem with the lower joints, in fact, is put on the ear. Now, you may think this is counterintuitive, 
but think again that how we human body control balance and control gait. So this slide perhaps is a giveaway that I just advanced a little bit too king. So the inner ear, you have three axis accelerometer. Effectively, you have the semicircular canals in three orthogonal directions, and also that you have the two linear accelerators inside. But that's you know, these are some of the, uh, uh, the basic revision that of the, how biology works, but let me just show you this uh, uh, sensor working action. You put the sensor on the ear, and of course that you can sense your overall body posture and motion. But what is interesting here, this is Julian, by the way, that he's going to show how we can use the human skeleton to transmit the shock waves. Now, of course, the, Overall motion orientation can be detected. He's going to tap his foot and kick his heel. Just watch those traces very carefully. Do you see the spikes? And this is really that using human, not only as a source of inspiration, but also as the medium to transmit the data and allow you to capture this in a very simple way. Now, why this is significant? One is that it provides a very simple way of if you want to do this for patients, and the compliance is a big issue. And secondly, it's simplicity. And also that you want the repeatability. You may need to make sure the sensor don't always end up in a different position. You start to have different data here put behind the ear is always very simple and also consistent over time. So here, if you can think about how do we translate the technology that to, for patient studies. Now with this, that you can see, what you see here is that some of the plots for patients with knee replacement. The green dot is one week before operation, and this bullseye is really where the normal should be. Of course, that the very nature, that the uh, you know, reason for those patients requiring knee replacement is because they don't have a normal joint. And you can see after three weeks, six weeks, which is a pink triangle, and also the green triangle was 12 weeks, and also the black square is 24 weeks. And how this is actually gradually moving back to normal. With all this, with a very simple sensing technology. Now you may ask why we need to bother to sense the gait and the posture and so on. This only can be applied to patients with uh, orthopedic problems. Well, in fact, the way how you walk, in fact, tells you many things about the potential onset of the diseases. For instance, that the scissors gait can be associated with the liver failure and the multiple sclerosis and so on. Then the, the, the steppage gait is associated with, uh, uh, with multiple sclerosis and also you know, uh, uh, muscle atrophy and a whole range of different things. So, of course, as a surrogate sign, this is not so specific per se, but at least that for most patients with historical information, with the context information of the patient, then you will be able to provide a very you know, nice way of reasoning of the progression, onset of the disease itself. So this is really where pervasive sensing is all about. You use direct sensing, which you can have in hospitals, specialized you know, uh, laboratories. Also, you use indirect sensing, surrogate science, do this pervasively. The key thing here is to change the traditional way of only providing a snapshot of patient's health into something that is continuous, pervasive, and also real time. And this is where sensing that comes into play. When we come down to addressing the global health challenges in terms of the aging population, the rising cost of prevention, the need for prevention, urbanization, and the environment impact, and so on, what you really need is something that will be able to sense in the background continuously, all the time, pervasively, and also being able to detect the onset of adverse events before it is too late to take intervention. So we are all clear about the aging population, the general trend, and what we really need to do is really to really manage the burden of chronic diseases. I think, you know, with this game, the focus on some of the technologies being developed, which is very, very timely, in that diabetes, hypertension, chronic heart failure, and all these chronic diseases, you're talking about the 5% of the population using up 60% of the healthcare costs. So you, we need to have a radical rethink of where the future healthcare needs to be provided and the role of hospitals. And with sensing technology, 
and this really answers some of the key things. So sh showing more examples that how the sensor can be used in some arthritis gate analysis directly and indirectly, the cardiac, cardiovascular measurement, and all the things can now be miniaturized that into something that is pervasive in the background. So I'm going to leave this slide here that uh, for the question. It's really the question and for the audience and also uh, you know, for the panel to discuss is really what is the role of pervasive sensing? We have developed some of the marvelous, marvelous technology that in the laboratory setting and also being used for sports training and so on. It's really how do we close this loop in terms of prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and evaluation. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. OK, thank you very much indeed. So some questions. Please. Wait for the microphone and tell us who you are, please. It's Paul Ferris Schentz, I will speak uh, soon. Uh, I think the barriers for these technologies are not technological. Do you, don't you think that the main barrier for this, it will be the adoptions in terms of regulatories and also business models to, to buy this, to acquire these kind of technologies? Absolutely. All this, all this really need to work together. I think the technology has come to a stage that it is possible to provide this information. You're absolutely right. The next stage is really look at the business model, look at the policy, and how do we do that? I think one of the things that we can discuss is that, that you know, in the national health scenario and in the American health provision setting, how can we actually put together a platform that is, can be adopted in both types of situations and the common ground for innovation? And I think for the research community, the priority here is really to make sure those devices that the compliance, address the compliance issues, address the cost issues, then this needs to work with, uh, you know, uh, 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 health provision, you know, NHS and so on, that they really look at the policy and, and maybe that, you know, also with Wellcome Trust is really to push this out in a global fashion. In the front row, then in the second row. Chris Malloy from IDBS. Uh, as a company that looks after R&D information and healthcare information management, I mean, you've created and everyone's created these wondrous panoply of sensors, which is creating data upon data upon data. Um, the organ that you haven't addressed or you haven't mimicked in this is the brain. What steps are you taking to try and bring this information together and make it consumable? Because surely that's the next big step. Absolutely. The whole thing about pervasive sensing is not about just beaming the raw data to a data center to be processed. It's not scale, it, it cannot be scaled up. So one of the focus that we are trying to do with those sensors is what we call the processing on node technology. It understands the con context, abstract the data on the node before you send it off, a lot of which is event triggered. When something goes wrong, you start to stream the data. When things are normal, you provide the stats. And this intelligent processing, both front end and back end, will play a big part in terms of come down to your problem, in terms of how do we actually roll this out in, for practical applications. Robertson, um, very interesting device. Uh, one of the problems with the population is the unique costs of mass manufacture and getting them costs down. Often that can be achieved by the art-science combination of finding applications which may have a mass market but can also support the, these kind of applications. Clearly, you're near the Royal College of Art and perhaps uh, uh, there's an opportunity here to find applications in the ordinary consumer market which may support your hearing device for the small audience which you are trying to uh, focus on here. Do you do that? Yes, we do, yes. I mean, in terms of uh, well-being, this is really where, you know, you can gradually, which I see this as the vehicle for moving towards healthcare in terms of using the mass market and have a device that is low cost, but you know, can do most of the things in terms of promote healthy lifestyle and towards more specific, you know, management of chronic disease. Absolutely. What you propose, what you said is a spot on. But I mean, that's a very critical question, isn't it? Because 
this is a business summit. How are you, you're a very fertile group in terms of the things that you're producing. Mm. How are you going to commercialize them? Well, we use three different avenues in terms of uh, business you know, creation. One, of course, that as a research institution, as a university, it's all about innovation, generating ideas that, uh, that with which that uh, we, through the licensing route, that uh, for some of the technology, and the other is in partnership with companies. For instance, that uh, you know, we are already in a very advanced stage, in fact, are currently working with Hong Kong Science Park in terms of uh, further developing those devices, actually, that can be rolled out in mass volume. And thirdly, is really to work with you know, uh, 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 government uh, uh, funding bodies to really to make sure that the technology is available as a generic platform for at the pre-competitive stage for industry. I mean, for us, it's really not about generating business for college, but it's really generating knowledge for the ecosystem. If we have a healthy ecosystem in terms of pervasive sensing to address both for sports, well-being, and healthcare, then we can have this many of those SMEs as well as the interest from large coasts that to bring this all together. And hopefully that we have another boom, not like the bus that we have the internet one, but have something that is really tangible, addressing a challenge that is faced by all the countries in terms of global health challenges, and use the Olympics as the vehicle to bring out one message, healthy lifestyle, well-being, and also to understand from the human performance to really understand the body. I think it could be a long conversation. There's two more questions, I think. One at the end, one in the front row, second. Uh, Alice, to some of all acuity design. Um, I work with disability groups. Um, one of the issues here is um, the ethics of getting people to accept that they're going to have a sensor net attached to them, um, particularly given that there is a much in the world of um, reversing the relationship from provider strength to independence and personalization. Uh, how are you dealing with these issues? I think, uh, you know, uh, there are different ways of addressing that. From us, is one of the key things is to come back to my uh, uh, comment earlier. Being able to provide processing on node really provides a layer of security and privacy because of what you are transmitting or potentially to be you know, uh, eavesdropped by others is really these are abstract information under which is a lot difficult to be broken. And the other things, of course, that in terms of technology, that, that the encryption and all those things need to be considered. And uh, this really drives the complexity of the system. But we are doing that by providing you know, uh, application-specific uh, uh, integrated circuits that to miniaturize that, and also develop new ASIC designs that combine with analog processing, with digital conjunction. So that's a whole range of you know, technology to support that. But uh, the, uh, uh, the, the processing on is really the key. It's just many, many of the challenges in terms of data handling, the security, and also the over-intelligence of the uh, network itself. So last quick question and quick answer. I'm Alison Graham, and I'm a human doctor, but my question follows on from the last gentleman about the other applications, and I couldn't help but think when you were showing about the, the winners that don't get medals in the Olympics is the horses. And I just sort of wondered, veterinary science, I think we've been incredibly interested in how we can actually improve so much of the blood stock and improvement there. So I'm just making a little push for our equine friends. <laughs> Absolutely. <yeah. laughs> That's a very good quick answer. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> okay, I think that was a splendid introduction to the session. So thank you very much indeed.